Hello, good evening and welcome to this evening's YFPF uh, event. We are delighted to welcome along a few great speakers this evening for our second in our Skills for Success series this year looking at adaption. And before we get into introducing the speakers and hearing from them, I just wanted to take a little bit of a look forward to the rest of the series. Um, so in a couple of weeks time, we're delighted to be welcoming uh, Jenny Russell, who's the RIBA's Interim Head of Education to talk through her two publications, How to Practice Architecture Well and How to Study Architecture Well. So that's going to be a very kind of broad brush look at moving from being um, a student to a young professional to a fully fledged professional. And then um, two weeks after that, on the 25th of November, uh, which is another Thursday evening, we have uh, a great range of speakers, um, including people from Peter Barber Architects, um, from Fosters, um, from Riders, uh, a couple of others to talk about um, urban, uh, exploring urban environments, so emerging urban environments, and that's um, on the 25th of November um, between 6 and 8. So without further ado, we'll move on to um, this evening, the matter at hand. Uh, this evening's uh, topic entitled Brutal Adaption. So we've got three speakers tonight to look at two different talks, um, roughly 20 or 30 minutes uh, per talk, and then we'll have a, an open question and answer session at the end. Um, there is uh, a questions box um, operates slightly differently to normal teams, so teams live events are the, uh, the questions that we kind of filtered through and, and, and passed through to the, to the speakers. We'll have time for questions at the end, but please do, do feel free to ask those into the chat box as we go along. Um, so we're, we're really happy to welcome along this evening James Perry, who's the co-founder and owner of Harper Perry Architects. Um, Daniel Byrne and Greg Moss. Um, Greg currently of Hawkins Brown, Dan formerly of Hawkins Brown, now currently of Hawkins Browns. Um, and between them, they're going to talk about a range of uh, buildings and topics to do with brutal adaption, adapting 21st, uh, 20th century buildings for the 20th century. So without further ado, I'll hand over to James uh, for our first talk this evening. Um, thanks very much. Please do ask your questions as we go along. Um, over to James. Thanks. Excellent. Thank you very much, Andy. I'm hoping everyone can hear me. Uh, if not, I'll, I'll, I'll get the nod. Um, obviously, I've been invited to talk a little bit about Dunelm House. It's a sort of it's a campaign around a building uh, in Durham that we've been working on for the past few years. Um, a little bit about myself and Harper Perry. We're a, we're a practice of two, uh, hopefully soon to be three, uh, based here in the centre of Newcastle. Um, we, we build small buildings like this with Centre for Life, and we also work on sort of big sort of uh, master planning work, uh, particularly around housing and urbanism, um, such as this project for Hull. And um, I suppose the question is, I'm, I'm, I'm doing that in a way to sort of caveat um, my knowledge and experience of the subject. My background is in housing and urbanism. About 10 years ago, we got involved uh, putting together this exhibition for the RIB North East, uh, documenting uh, the post-war history of the North East. And so from that, we then went on to uh, set up something concrete and modern, which is an online archive, basically disseminating all that information that we gathered um, through an RIBA uh, research grant and sort of by default <laughs> have become custodians, I guess, of, uh, of this sort of legacy, um, which is incredible, by the way. I would, if you haven't visited, uh, visit the site, something concrete and modern. There's a great sort of history of uh, the sort of origins of architecture and, and the practice across that sort of that cultural practice across across the northeast. Um, and I suppose off the back of that, the talk is about demolition. So we're looking at Dunelm House. Um, in 2016, end of 2016 in December, uh, Durham University announced an international competition to demolish Dunelm House and replace it with a new uh, cultural hub, I think they were calling it. Um, and I think that sort of just, that spurred myself and a few others into action around what I think is a really great building. I'm not going to assume everybody knows it very well. Uh, for those of you um, who have never visited, you've got here's a, a, a plan of Durham. You've got the peninsula in the centre. In, in the uh, light blue, you've got uh, light blue to the bottom, you've got the cathedral and to the north, you've got the castle. And in the sort of darker grey hatch, you've got um, you've got uh, Dunelm House. Um, it's an incredibly complex building, uh, set across I think seven different stories. And I'm just, I'm, I'm going to rattle through the plans because it gives you a great overview, of sort of understanding of, of 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 the complexity of the building uh, that sort of gets its form from the site, um, sort of the natural geology. So you can sort of you step down to a sort of series of offices and administrative 
spaces. It's it's a students' union. Obviously, it was it was built in around 1966, uh, around the time that Durham uh, Newcastle University was formed from uh, 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 King's College, which was an old Durham College, and so they needed a new sort of heart, as it were, to the to the campus. Um, which came in the form of, of, of Denelm House, uh, you know, sort of offices and administration. Here you start to see a bar on the left hand side. And as you go down, you've got kitchens hidden in the centre of the plan. Again, more offices around the periphery, large cafetiere, bar, and heading down into sort of function rooms and an auditoria right down on the River Weir and a boathouse. So, incredibly dramatic, incredibly complex building. Uh, designed by ACP, Architects Called Partnership, uh, engineered by Ove Arup, or Ove Arup and Partners, the practice, uh, sits alongside what was already listed, uh, the Kingsgate Bridge, which you can see here on this on the uh, bottom drawing. Uh, that's Grade 2 listed. It's obviously it's one of Ove Arup, it's one of his favourite structures from his career. And, um, you know, he's had his ashes cast off there and there's a, there's a bust at one end on, on Donnell House. So, Incredibly important, incredibly dramatic, incredibly unique, uh, clever response to the site. Really beautiful to some. <laughs> um, and so, so d d d I think it's clear that Durham University sort of began this campaign of wanting to um, demolish it, replace it. And it, it, it sort of raised a lot of questions, I think, about um, how, we, how we act, I guess, as custodians of buildings and our city. Um, I think it's fair to say it's, it's a building that's not been particularly well looked after. Um, it's slightly chaotic inside, all the sort of original sort of hidden sort of um, features and electrics have all been sort of replaced by conduits and services and concrete's been painted, almost every surface of concrete's been painted, some gaudy colours. Um, and so what we did, we sort of campaign, I guess it's a bit of activism. Um, we started with a petition and we got about three and a half thousand people. Uh, we took that to the estates department, uh, who were a bit incredulous, I guess, uh, that anyone would be interfering in their job. But here, here we were. Um, we got hold of a report from Arabs that was produced. Uh, I suppose you call it a bit, it's a sort of semi technical report looking at, you know, sort of uh, exposure of, uh, of rebar and. Um, you know, they're pointing at all the bits of, you know, bad workmanship, essentially, but, you know, superficial essential repairs uh, that haven't been carried out, you know, sort of wet concrete, you know, thermal bridging services that are out of date in sort of in many ways. We looked at this as it's sort of it's sort of a big long list of things of, of issues of repair and maintenance and sort of general. Um, Sort of general looking after the building that have, have gone missing, I guess, over the sort of 50, I think we're now about 57 years old, is it? Um, but not insurmountable problems. We felt, you know, sort of all building services all need replacing, you know, you've got leaking pipes that are not insulated. Um, and so we set up a crowdfunder. We raised about, I think, about £8,000 in the end. And we decided we needed to challenge that report. Um, it was a perfectly fine sort of base level report, but it, you know it needed it needed unpicking, and I feel like um, there wasn't certainly enough creative thinking around future uses, adaptation, modification, retrofitting of that building. In fact, sort of design seems to have been omitted from from the role in terms of Durham thinking about its future of its building. So, so we we thought we'd hold a charrette. Uh, we went in and we just booked a room um, at, inside the building. Uh, we um, called around lots of friends, and um, I, f I felt like we felt like it needed a, a degree of stature um, in terms of who we invite. But we sort of ended up mixing it with large and small practices. Uh, so I've got we've, we invited Six A, we've got Hawkins Brown, we've got Levitt Bernstein. I guess are the sort of big well-known names, and then we mixed them up with the uh, local practice, Mawson and Kerr. We've got Studio Shaw, uh, Mark Shaw from London, he's a great architect, uh, and then basically. You know, did a bit of blind date work and, and partnered them up. We've got Webb Yates, uh, Steve Webb came, Skelly and Cooch uh, on the mechanical engineering side, we've got Rosie Jones, who's absolutely a brilliant engineer. Um, we've got Studio Horn locally, we've got Newcastle University, uh, provided some engineering services. Uh, we invited the 20th Century Society along, Owen Hathley came along, we've got Graham Farmer, Professor Farmer from the from the architecture school and invited Durham University Estates 
together. And it was a, a charrette in the true sense of we started at 9 a.m. in the morning. Uh, everyone got, got, got the earliest train. We used the crowdfunding money to sort of host this event, pay for everyone's travel and accommodation. We wrote a brief, we prepped them, and we, we it was fairly open-ended brief, just asking for, for sort of ideas of reuse, sort of very high level. Um, I'm going to try to run through them very quickly. I've, I've actually got quite a lot to cover, um, but I've, I've picked three of, of, of my favourite uh, submissions. Uh, we worked, uh, we had 6A, who reconfigured the building in terms of well, one of its big issues is its accessibility. So it has a large central staircase that runs um, north to south, and uh, it's been an accessibility problem. Previous reports have recommended, uh, you know, lifts being inserted, and it's always been a problem about where the lift goes. And what I love about this one, it, 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 there's a courtyard at the centre of the plan, and the proposal is essentially to excavate right through the centre of the building and build, a, I think it's almost like a, a 10 storey structure right through the middle that provides access off of every floor. Uh, in addition to sort of obviously additional uh, teaching space, uh, we've got this sort of beautiful drawing, just sort of trying to think of it as another tower in the landscape. Sort of it's, it's, it's not, it's a much more, um, I guess, bold response where the building is, uh, it, it is quite subtle in its sort of response to the landscape. Um, you know, so they're perhaps thinking about circular economy so you've got the coffin lids and you can't quite see them on there we'll get to them in a minute um this this shows this shows the sort of the the, the sequencing work i guess with how it would be to to sort of excavate that courtyard and, and build up to create the uh to address the accessibility problems building yeah here we go these these, these are what referred to as the coffin lids <laughs> um or the graveyard as the roof is sometimes referred to it's it's, it's been a systemic problem that if no one's ever seemed to have bothered to repaired at the university uh, of the leaking roof and so they're stripping it off putting in a zinc roof which was a part of the original proposal and then hanging uh, the sort of concrete coffins off the new structure as a sort of weatherproofing layer um, and there you go you can sort of see how you get access um, you know through, through throughout a quite a complex building um, and they produce these sort of visuals just to, using the old historic photographs of the building uh, so it, it's essentially they're saying keep it as a student unit, student union, and um, you know c celebrate that. Don't don't be timid. Don't be trying to look for a sort of a reuse, uh, sort of a, an alternative use to sort of force something else in there. Um, got Hawkins Brown came along, um, and I quite like their approach. It looks more as a as from a master planning point of view. Obviously, this sits within a, a large master plan for the university. It's just a very small element. Uh, the reconfiguring of the Elbert Riverside. Um, and I quite like, you know, it's an approach that comes more from a, a commercial uh, sensibility in that it, you know, I, I, I think Hawkins Brown brought the sort of experience of working with other universities across the country and trying to think about how they might reconfigure that master plan. And, and their response to Donnell was to essentially a, a hotel to think of it as a modernist hotel to strip out and celebrate the modernism, but to also extend it so you can sort of see there's a small wing, you know, sort of sympathetic design uh, in, in order to sort of cater for, for that, um, you know, essentially parents, that parent market in a sort of a, a fairly poor, well, I've only ever stayed in one Durham hotel. It's, it's not a particularly great market. Uh, so I think it's, it, it's trying to think about the university sort of commercial potential with their buildings. It, it, it's quite a sort of uh, a different approach. Uh, shall we say? So it's again sort of splitting, splitting the plan up, keeping things. I know the bar stays in the same place. You know, you've got a lot of administrative offices which could be kept, and then it's sort of then using the new extension. I think there we've got seventy beds. So it's a quite, it's, an, it's, a, it's a considerably sized hotel uh, reworking of the building. Uh, obviously, with large function space and conference space right down in the basement, um, and then finally. I'm going to just present quickly Morton and Kerr's plans, which I think they were incredibly, incredibly popular. It's to think about the building as a technical college um, for exploring sustainable refurbishment. So treating the building essentially as a live case study um, to repair it sort of in situ as a sort of ongoing sort of story. Uh, and so splitting up the spaces into sort of technical training rooms uh, and treating the building as a sort of a live workshop, I guess, uh, to sort of constantly be sort of repairing it and testing out. 
And I think it's it's certainly tapped into a market. Obviously, I don't Durham University are too interested in it, but there's certainly a sort of I think there's um, there would be a certain market I think to sort of that technical college in the northeast that I feel like we're missing. Um, so I think I think I think you know three quite refreshing approaches. Uh, we did it all in person in the luxury of when we could see each other. Um, and this is in one of the conference rooms inside the Elm House. Um, we did it in a very traditional <laughs> pinning up on the wall uh, sort of way, a sort of round panel uh, debate and discussion. And then we have we've we've taken that information, we've written it up into a book, which I've, I've got a draft by myself, which we, we, it's due to be published this year. Uh, we're going to present that back. Um, and I think following on from working on this, we we did a bit of a, a deeper dive. So I think the thing that inspired us to sort of take on this as a bit of a, a pet project was um, the historian Barnabas Calder. I don't know if anyone's familiar with from Liverpool, um, came and gave a talk at Durham University. Um, exploring and basically his presentation was on the idea of architecture and energy and the idea of, of, of our buildings, thinking about our history, the history of architecture as a series of, of, of um, you know, buildings um, as energy stores, they, they, they essentially have, they've, we've expended carbon to, to, to in order to deliver them. And then I suppose to waste them is then to sort of be sort of frivolous and reckless with that idea of energy. So with that, we've then gone on to look a little bit at Durham and beyond. Um, so we were given a copy of uh, Durham University's master plan, which is, um, it's not very readily available uh, for some reason, but um, you know Durham are a university on a, who have a plan, I guess, for the next until 2027, exploring um, a number of projects. Uh, this this one being one, obviously, this is now I guess being aborted, uh, thankfully, which is which is where you see the site of Durnelm House to the bottom there with a the cultural hub in it's and it's as, as, as a replacement. Um, and so we did a little bit of number crunching around that. So it's something new to me, <laughs> but calculating, you know, asking the question, how much does my building weigh? So Denelm House is quite a simple one in that um, it, uh, it's, it's in situ concrete. You know, we can calculate the floor areas. We can make some assumptions about floors and walls. Um, and so we, we, we came up with a very conservative figure of about 1,600,000 um, tonnes of concrete. Oh, sorry, sorry. 8,240 tonnes, but 16, uh, 1,631 tonnes of carbon, embodied carbon. So that, that has a, that's a significant amount. Um, and, and so we've subsequently done a little bit of work just looking at, um, so if you take on the left-hand side, if you say 1,600 or so tonnes of embodied carbon in the existing building, um, if we were to do a deep retrofit, we'd assume about half the embodied energy of the current RBA 2030 targets. Um, we'd get us somewhere to about two and a half thousand tonnes. But if we were to demolish, so we lose that carbon that's stored and to build uh, from new, we end up somewhere close to around about 7,200 uh, tonnes of embodied carbon. And so actually you have this this difference between retrofitting a new build of about 7,000, 7, uh, sorry, 4,700 tonnes of carbon, which is which it's sometimes a little bit of a difficult one to sort of fathom. Um, there we are, sorry, it's uh, not moving on. Uh, so the equivalent of that is about 3.8 million litres of petrol, which will drive you around the world about 300 times or it's two and a half the thousand tons of uh, coal being burned. It could, you know, we could power 600 homes for a year or 30 homes for 20 years. Um, and we would need a, a, a quite considerable forest. Um, and to put that into perspective, sorry, my, uh, there we are, map of Durham with the peninsula at the center. That's that's equivalent. That's this is the equivalent forest you would need to plant in order to um, make that new building carbon neutral. The difference in energy 
Uh, over 20 years, you need a forest with the size of 1.15 uh, kilometers squared, um, which is, you know, I, I think it's problematic. There, there are problematic issues with looking at sort of uh, offsetting, but it, 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 it's trying to come up with a, a method for sort of uh, understanding the sort of the, the consequences of demolition. Uh, and we've gone in to look at the master plan as well. You know, that's that's something uh, that has absolutely astronomical <laughs> levels of demolition. Uh, looking at something around about uh, 4,000, uh, so 450,000 meters squared of demolition um, in this master plan. Now, I'm assuming COVID's probably done something to derail that sort of master plan. Um, but essentially, it's a path that you know, I'm, I'm very critical of Durham University, but it, it's because I, I don't feel like the carbon has been measured um, from, from, from building waste in simple terms. And that um, on a current path, in a current culture where we, we choose always to, I guess, demolish and to replace, we're, we're going to be sort of be, uh, it, it, it's essentially a hiding to nowhere. <laughs> um, and a, a one of exponential sort of um, uh, carbon emissions, both in the sort of the embodied and also one that, you know, one that I don't think ever pays off in terms of the embodied energy, the embodied savings. Um, I never seen so. I will. It's it's quite there's there's quite a, a, a lot to cover in terms of, of, of delivering that master plan. Uh, sort of you know, off the scale. Uh, in in terms of the, the, the key take home figure for me there is that you could run a coal fired power station for five and a half months. Uh, sorry, five yeah five and a half months if we were to 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 deliver that entire master plan uh, in its full. Um, thankfully. Uh, there's some sense <laughs> seen, I guess, and we had the announcement last year, sorry, earlier this year, um, of the listing, um, which I guess is positive news. Uh, but um, I think we're still yet to sort of see plans from the university. I think I believe they're sort of uh, uh, in the sort of throes of reconsidering the whole of the Elvert Riverside as one, which is great. I think I'm hoping we can keep up that pressure to lobby them. Um, to be to, to prioritizing retrofit first of these buildings, you know, sensitive, you know, extensions. Um, and sort of adapting Durham uh, for the 21st century rather than sort of this sort of, you know, business as usual attitude. I think things have to change. Uh, we're certainly to meet, you know, whatever the target is, whether that's your RBA 2030 target or your 2050 net zero. Um, by the government. So, yeah, thank you very much. I think that's me. Thanks very much, James. Um, I think we'll move on to uh, the second presentation of the evening and then come back for questions for um, for everyone um, following both presentations. So um, without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, Greg Moss, partner at Hawkins Brown, and Daniel Byrne, uh, associate at Fortnite Browns, formerly of uh, Hawkins Brown to talk a little bit about Sheffield's Park Hill estate. Thank you. Thanks, Andrew. Sorry about that. I hope you can all see that on screen now. OK. Um, so Dan and I are going to do a, a little bit of a double act. Um, just to explain the context a bit, um, Dan and I are um, well, good friends, but ex-colleagues and um, Dan and I worked on Park Hill for quite a number of years whilst he was at Hawkins Brown. Um, I worked on Park Hill uh, for well well over a decade, really. Um, so it's quite a big chunk of my career. Um, so what we're going to talk about is um, really the, as a kind of retrospective of um, the first decade, if you like, of Park Hill's reinvention um, and sort of our sort of reflections on that. Um, and sort of it's quite interesting really kind of talking with Dan about this. I mean, we spent a lot of time in the studio working on this, but also ruminating it on the on the train journeys up to Sheffield from uh, from London as well. So it's very close to our hearts personally as well. So if we flick onto the next slide, please, Dan. Um, so as you can imagine, um, working on Park Hill was um, something of an odyssey, both both in terms of the scale of the building, but also the the time scales that actually um, we encountered in um, sort of early days. 
from the the um, inception of the project to the handover of the first phase, which is our primary involvement. Um, a bit of, I mean, Park Hill is very well documented, but um, you know, there's a few key facts really which influenced, certainly influenced our approach, but influenced its um, the reason fundamentally why it was protected. Um, it's Europe's biggest listed building. Uh, it was completed in 1961, so. It's now 60 years old. Um, when we started working on it, uh, it was 40 years old. So even actually during the timescale of our involvement, it's actually become quite a bit older. Um, and, and it's again, I'll come back to that point later. Um, so what we're going to look at is what made Park Hill so special and why it deserves the legacy that it's got now and, and sort of how it moves into the future and the next um, sort of series of decades, really. Um, if you flick on again, please, Dan. And then this is a sort of slightly flippant um, image, really. But um, when when I first started my involvement um, or my knowledge of Park Hill, which was as a student in Sheffield in, in the late 90s, um, we did a renovation of part of the um, fifth year work with Jeremy Till to renovate one of the flats. And we got really sort of nominal funding from um, English Heritage to do this. And at that point, I could never have dreamed that really Park Hill would be, you know, at some point later, sort of on the um, cover of the, the, well, the property section of the evening standard in a completely different city being held up by tube travellers sort of on the way to work. So it's kind of really was quite a quite a sort of big um, you know, series of changes which took Park Hill from, you know, one place to somewhere where it's, you know, very different, very different place, really. And then to the next slide, please, Dan. Um, and I think one of the most striking things about our work on Park Hill was, you know, clearly everyone is well aware of the scale and, you know, obviously the use of the, the term sort of brutalism and, uh, you know, all the various connotations of what that might be. But I think almost the opposite of that is that actually um, reflecting on it at every point along the, the journey, it was actually a very human story. So from talking to the original residents to the building's current you know, commercial occupiers at the lower levels, or even meeting the original architects sort of during the during the process. Um, it's always kind of belied that that brutal image. Um, and this is one of the the photos we had um, sort of following the the initial completion, um, where really it is starting to become you know uh, more manifestly humanised really. Um, and if you go to the next slide, I think the other thing is um, the the way that Park Hill now sits as part of the city. Um, the, the, again, the, through the the, the um, passage of time, the new Park Hill is actually quite a familiar part of the Sheffield skyline now, um, which is, you know, clearly for years and years it had a very different connotation. So, um, one of the remits that we had to ourselves was that was that it should always wear its kind of renovation and its new the new Park Hill on its sleeve, and that was one of the the challenges that we set ourselves that. It should have this sort of um, evidence of a kind of transformative change, and it should actually, you know, wear that you know, very publicly. Um, so we're going to move on to a bit more detail now about um, why was Park Hill listed. Um, a bit of the, a few more sort of stats about that. It was Grade Two star listed in 1998, um, obviously quite some time ago now. Um, at that time, it had gone from um, the, the relatively well received um, sort of welcome and initial few years that it had. It was, um, you know, when, when Park Hill was opened, it was only the very uh, sort of most favoured residents in Sheffield. You could actually get onto Park Hill. So if you were a week behind or in arrears on your on your rental payments, you, you know, you were sort of frowned upon really. So it was it was sort of very well esteemed in the early years, but Again, we'll come back to more detail about why this changed, but by the point at which it's, it was listed, um, it had almost become a no go go area. Um, it's dilapidated and you know maligned. And this photo was was I think sort of taken um, probably about well after the lift listing, but um, sort of early 2000s around the time of the architectural um, competition. Um, so if you flick on Dan, please. Um, I mean, the, the design itself, again, just to, to 
stand back and sort of reflect, it, it's clearly very well known as, as a really polemic solution to um, and one of the best examples of lots of um, very revolutionary architectural thinking, obviously born in, in the ideas of the Smithsons and the whole notions of streets in the sky. Um, but in, in the particular instance of Park Hill, it's about how it marries those ideas with the topography, obviously a steeply sloping site, um, and using the gradient that's obviously apparent in Sheffield, but also some of the accommodation, it's all, all of the accommodation itself, how um, a very clever interlocking three bay wide by three bay high um, building block that we call the standard cluster, a sort of Rubik's cube of, of accommodation, becomes the sort of um, the essence of the scheme really. And then that, that very quickly builds up over the scale that Park Hill is, a sort of very elaborate and very complex elevation. So I think I think really the the reason why you know Park Hill was listed in that sense was clearly its amb ambition and the, the the sort of built implementation of it. Um, if you flip to the next, please, Dan. Um, this is one of the um, streets in the sky, and uh, the scheme initially worked well. And I think this you know this is well charted territory with um, you know, the use of the milk floats, um, the, the ideas of the the children sort of playing on the on the streets and so on. But the vision wasn't really enough to overcome the decline in management. Um, and that's sort of both socially and also in terms of building maintenance and the, the pragmatics of the scheme and the technical demands. So it entered a sort of vicious cycle of decline really where um, as, as the building use and the and the, the the level of occupancy declined so the perception of the building declined as well and it sort of you know got to a very very low point around the time and it, you know the, the low ebb really was the the point at which it was listed um and if you go to the next slide please dan um at the same time there's a few kind of parallel things going on really so um there's a lot of intellectual debate about um what would happen to park hill next in light of its listing so um, this is a architectural association book which was published around the time with a series of essays about, um, you know, how what was the what was the um, sort of ethically and socially the right approach to Park Hill's reinvention. Um, so the you know these were very much sort of at the forefront of our mind as we you know we knew the scheme's architects and it was um, it was really the the ball was in Sheffield City Council's court to actually kickstart the the. The process of of the um, of the listing and, and the, then the subsequent competition. And if you go to the next slide, please, Dan. But nevertheless, it was you know it was unpopular and um, underoccupied. And you know, despite the the sort of um, the very rich architectural legacy, you know, on the ground, so to speak, in Sheffield, it was you know not not a particularly pleasant place to be, and it was uh, wasted wasted sort of opportunity really. Um, and other other things going on in Sheff Sheffield at the time. Um, if you go to the next slide, then please. Um, Hyde Park flats, which were slightly further over to the east of the site, you can see them in the um, background of this image. The upper section of Hyde Park um, had been demolished in the early 90s, um, and then the lower part, which you can see in the in the middle distance there, um, that was. Um, really under threat of demolition as well. Um, and once again, if you flick onto the next slide, this is um, Kelvin Flats, which is probably about a mile or so away from Park Hill, further down the Don Valley um, to the to the north and east. Um, this was actually demolished. So this was really kind of contributory factor to why English heritage um, instigated the listing of Park Hill as perhaps the, the certainly the most original but also the best example of the implementation of the um, the streets in the sky and and the whole sort of um, language of, of of this accommodation. And then the next factor was um, the high the low section of high part flats was demolished. Um, sorry, not demolished. It was um, reclad as part of the student games, um, the World Student Games in 1991. And you can see by this pretty um, uh, vigorous overcladding it was it was um a move that kind of completely obliterated the streets in the sky um and it 
cloaked and overclad the exposed concrete grid, which is obviously a key part of the um, the aesthetics of Park Hill. So again, this was pretty much the sort of the final straw really in terms of English heritage's, heritage's uh, sort of outlook really. And then that that did lead to um, to Park Hill being listed. So um, that's the sort of start of the story of, of how Park Hill um, came to have this this great two star status, which gave it protection and you know it really did save it. So I'm going to hand over to Dan now, who's going to talk a bit um, bit more in detail. Thanks, Greg. Um, yeah, so um, we wanted to share um, a, a sort of a breakdown, I suppose, of the key um, special qualities of Park Hill, the good bits, and then the things that that didn't work well. And, and I think um, it's sort of quite a unique position to be in when looking at an existing building, because you have this opportunity to critique someone else's work, and I suppose also to um, to, to celebrate it as well. And I think one thing I'm conscious of and looking back on it is that the, the good bits and the bad bits weren't always apparent at the start. And, we, and I think we changed our approach to them as we went through the project and some of them were emerged to us um, as the project developed. So um, I think at the outset, when we, when we look at the master plan, I think one of the, the, the real qualities of the building is it's sort of um, it's, it's form and Greg alluded to it, the way that it was cascades down the, down the hill, down the, the, the topography of Sheffield, seven hills of Sheffield, you know, the kind of um, topography is, is one of the characters of the city and then Park Hill deals with it incredibly well, um, both in terms of the way it touches the ground. So at the, at the if, if, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but at the, um, the right hand side of the image, the building is about four stories high. And then it rises to 13 stories on the, on the left hand side of the image where the building's um, indicated in red there. So the building itself cascades down the hill. Um, and actually the way that it's orientated is also really incredible um, with the um, the homes and, and uh, with each of the homes, their living space looks out over the city with incredible views south and west. And then internally it creates kind of a sheltered courtyard. So so so, so the key thing is about kind of the um, the orientation, the, the urban form, the, the plan is, is really special and obviously a, a huge part of the building's character. And then the other thing is the frame and, and, and the frame is part of um, the character It's a key part of the listing. And it was something obviously that we really weren't going to make it make make um, a huge change to in terms of breaking the building, but celebrating that and, and, and how we dealt with it in the detail, um, it was key to us. And, and, even, and hopefully we'll be able to share a bit more of that as we go through these slides. But also with the frame, and this is this is an image of the um, during the demolition period um, when the building was left exposed. So the demolition effectively stripped all the um, um, elements back to the concrete frame itself. But as I said before, you know we found um, information about the frame in this state that we didn't know about before. Some of the um, the subtleties of the um, the shape of the columns, the, the the width and the proportion of the frame emerged to us. Um, and there was a huge amount of intelligence in the original design by. Um, Arup and uh, the Sheffield City Council in terms of the proportion of that frame and its suitability for housing that came apparent to us as, as, as we, um, we we sort of learned more about the frame in detail. So um, so moving from the frame it's then towards the the streets and I suppose alluding to it before is the the key signature is the streets in the sky um, and this image shows the elevation and, and the sort of the banding um, through the middle it's, it's shown it's shown one of those streets um, but what the what the architects did originally was to which was to sort of uh, define the streets uh, simply with bricks so there's four different bricks in the original building and they each of those brick colours signify the four streets of, of the streets in the sky and each of those streets was named after one of the streets that formerly sat on the site when it was in its former um, um, use as a kind of um, uh, sort of back to back housing that cascaded down the hill. So the kind of subtle material banding spoke a lot about the, the key signature of the building plan itself. And then moving towards the the aperture, so we sort of described this as the approach to the facade and then the aperture. So the, the building as it looks out over the city, um, and as I said before, the living space is looking out with long views over, over Sheffield. The way that they set up the um, proportion of solid to glazed elements was was approximately one third, two thirds. So, you know, you had this fantastic open 
um, aspect over the city, and that was something that we um, we, we really took uh, took on uh, when we redeveloped the facade, um, maintaining that proportion and increasing the proportion of glazing where possible. And obviously, we had the benefit of being able to use much higher quality materials, and provide insulation, and better better performing glass. So. Um, you know, we kind of celebrated that that part of the original design in, in our um, reincarnation of the design. And then also in the detail of the facade, the kind of depth uh, of, the, of the aperture, the depth of the facade, um, sort of loosely in three layers. You know, you've got the kind of um, the first step where you've got panels which sit within the concrete frame and the way that they sit provide shadow and, and reveal, reveals and a reveal, reveal to the window opening so it kind of you know provides for, for um, articulation of the building across across the whole facade such a big facade in places and then and then two other steps so the kind of deep step where you you provide uh, residential balconies for sitting out on and the sort of mid step where you've got what we call the islet balcony uh, which you can see in the middle of the image here with the red panel um, so you've got this kind of um, depth of reveal and actually the islet balcony you should say was quite interesting in its in the first incarnation of the building in that they actually provided escape fire escape so you could actually escape from one apartment to the next through the connecting balcony um, in the event of a fire so um, i think the next the next thing is, is really interesting and i think um you know the, we, you know it was um so matter of fact, the original design, this is this is an image of the service trench which runs underneath the building and I believe it runs almost through the entire site and I only ever um, went through a short section in, 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 in the um, in the low in the highest um, building on the site, but this all connected back to a district heating system. Um, and so um, when we came to the project, you know, we were able then to reconnect this system uh, with modern, modern materials, modern systems. But actually the kind of matter of fact approach to services actually was incredibly useful to us retrofitting the building and allowed us to kind of strip it back and refit it. We were able to get in there and actually physically walk, walk in this space um, and obviously made a huge difference to us in the flexibility of, of us when we started to replan these homes. So it's a really key part of the, the project, which is sort of hidden, but actually, you know, it really, really allowed us to um, to change the way the building was um, was serviced. And then the residential cluster, and Greg alluded to this. There's a sort of standard cluster um, through Park Hill, which pro you know, loot, um, approximately maybe 80% of the homes within Park Hill fall within this standard cluster. So, in the original incarnation of the design, um, um, there were five homes within within these clusters. Um, and then we, when we came to it, we defined it as four homes within a cluster, and that was partly to um, rationalise the plan. Um, but each of these clusters um, provides access from the street, so there's a front door. Um, so, there's, so the four homes all, all have a front door onto the street, and then you come in and either go up the stairs or down the stairs. So you've got kind of a, um, a maisonette that runs over two levels and you've got dual aspect, dual aspect um, living spaces looking out across both sides of the building. So, um, you know, the um, as, I, as I flick through these, this, this, this is a model we created to describe this. I think this is a one to 50, 50 scale model. So really useful model, but it describes the makeup of each of those clusters. So. You can approximately see at the centre of this image, you can see the stairs there. So within the stairs, there's a, a, a really important feature, which is the H column, which is a sheer wall that runs up and down the building. And that sheer wall allows the rest of the plan to be or, you know, within reason flexible because there are no other columns or, or, or sheer walls within the plan. So when we came to it and stripped it back, we were then able to sort of flexibly reconfigure the plan of the homes. And we did them in, in we did a huge number of iterations, but this was the the iteration that stuck for the standard cluster within uh, within the um, the word that we did at Park Hill. And then moving to the to the the less the bad bits, the the the, the poorly considered bits perhaps, but um, um, you know hugely important as ever in architecture to sort of um, to challenge the bits that go wrong. And it was it. Um, I think this list um, explains some of the architectural things that maybe with the original building, but obviously also some of the the environmental things that happened. You know through the political changes through the 70s and 80s, um, the change in the social. Um, um, makeup of the building um, and issues that 
surrounded that in terms of um, you know real um, um, concerns about security, but also an impression of, of, of poor security. Um, and then also things like, you know, as Greg alluded to, you know, poor management and, and um, you know, just the maintenance strategy not working. So there's all the environmental things that, that we sort of felt led to um, some of the um, the problems that Park Hill had when it, in the sort of late 90s. And some of those things were ar around the original design. I think it's fair to say that um, at the ground floor of the building, the public realm as was, was um, didn't activate the streets particularly well. It didn't it didn't uh, provide a kind of safe environment for the services that go around such a big development, and you, you know the, all the services you kind of need for such a big population. Um, I think issues of surveillance were a problem were a problem there, um, and, and and compounded the kind of uh, feeling of um, poor security, and then. Through the, through the lack of maintenance, uh, there were technical uh, issues um, that I'll go on to talk about in a second. So I think one of the things that was a, was a key um, issue at the start of the project um, was its sort of dislocation from the rest of the city. So actually it's on the wrong side of the tracks in sort of physically, metaphorically. Um, it's dislocated, whilst it's very close to the centre, it is slightly dislocated. So the kind of connection for people living there to the city was challenging and obviously up a hill, up a slippery cobbled street as you see here. I think also the entrance to the building was 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 poorly defined. Uh, it was kind of quite hidden. It was a single story entrance. Um, and we're going to talk about you know, how we sort of re envisioned the entrance in a second. There were maintenance issues and some in some places the original concrete frame did deteriorate. I think there were around 4000 repairs uh, when we came to the project and um, that we that we carried out. And this image is of uh, one of the precast uh, residential balustrades which were all removed and replaced uh, in the work that we did. And then I mentioned the good qualities of the outward facing um, facade, the outward facing facade looking over the city, the inward facing facade was less um, was less sensitively designed I suppose, you know, there was much less um, natural light, smaller windows, um, it, I think there was issues with condensation and, and damp and, and ventilation and so the actual sort of proportion of, of glazing to solid there was was probably not in, in, the, in the right um, um, in the right balance and that was something we developed when we came to the project to to readdress that. And then um, the, the Park Hill had an incredibly ambitious um, waste system, you know, waste systems make or break a, a lot of residential projects, but the Garchet system at, at Park Hill didn't work. It was um, uh, unfortunately it was uh, it was um, uh, misused. People put down, put things down that they shouldn't have done. It was blocked. So it quite quickly became out of service. And then also the um, the stair and the sort of uh, vertical circulation hierarchy um, to move between levels um, was quite tricky. So if you if you want to visit neighbours, you know you had to go down sort of quite a windswept um, escape stair to sort of connect to people you might live with in the same development. Um, and so that kind of hierarchy of circulation around the building um, uh, wasn't wasn't ideal, and that was something we we looked at when we came to the project. The streets in the sky, you know, the signature thing, the signature um, thing that we all remember when we think of Park Hill. You know, the connection between the original streets and, and the sort of new image of the, the building um, um, in a high level. But actually quite poorly connected and, and, and very poor visibility from the homes to the to the streets. So actually it became quite windswept and, uh, and quite bleak because there was just no connection between the interior and, and this space. And there are also stories of, um, you know, uh, you know, when shift shift at the factory was was coming on, there'd be footsteps of people travelling to work and kind of echoing down these corridors. So there were some environmental problems with these streets as well. And then, as I said before, the ground level of the building, the kind of the sort of flatness and the kind of lack of uh, connection between the street and the interior spaces was was very clear to us and the sort of connection between the ground floor shops and pubs and things and the external spaces, there wasn't a kind of um, a connection between the two of them. So they were quite in quite quite quickly um, misused and just just became uh, spaces where people, you know, were um, prone to be, be sort of doing anti antisocial behaviour, as you can see here. So I'll pass then back to Greg. Thanks, Dan. Um, 
So this is an image of the Reserve Matters permission, um, which basically sort of reflects the, the initial master plan for the scheme. And again, just reflecting on this, um, this is um, this was approved um, back in 2007. So by the time that the construction started on site, um, and if you remember back to the sort of the, the police or political and economic period, then there's a lot of changes. There's the economic downturn. And actually, we found that what we got planning permission for in 2007, um, three, four years later, was no longer relevant. Um, so in terms of our key interventions, probably our a couple of our key interventions was not to do certain things. So, for instance, you can see in the um, sort of upper left of that image, um, that's actually a multi-storey car park that we were going to, we got permission for. We still have permission for at Park Hill, but um, thankfully it, you know, um, uh, sort of owner car park requirements sort of fell off a cliff a bit. And, you know, I think Urban Splash as developer were, um, I think, to be applauded in sort of pushing the, the minimising of the the car parking provision in the, in the rejuvenated scheme, really. So, I think that's probably one of the key interventions. Um, but going on to sort of, um, if you like, more tangible physical um, interventions. Um, next slide, please, Dan. The first of these really is, um, and this is this is probably a couple of years old now, um, but it was to bring the park back into Park Hill, and to use um, a much more open and um, less segregated approach to the public realm was a really key thing. So um, Dan mentioned about the the, the sort of um, the shopping precinct, which was, if you like, just sort of um, placed in the middle of the scheme. It was actually on the site of a prior primary school. It was demolished um, to, to make way for the, the, the new development. Um, so the, the the greening of the site and bringing um, some of the parkland, particularly to the west in between Park Hill and the station, into the site was a really key thing. And that also allowed us to have a much softer approach to the level changes. So we could get a kind of one in 20 route that went all the way from, um, you can see, if you can see in the foreground of the picture, up to the middle blocks in the in the background. So um, that was the first key, in key intervention. Um, and then undoubtedly, I've, I've sort of talked a little bit about it already, but the, the kind of transformative change of the facade was really quite quite key. Um, and that also allowed us to, to um, have a very positive relationship with English heritage, as they were at the time, obviously now historic England, where they they had a very progressive attitude to Park Hill. They, you know, they didn't want to preserve it in aspic. They, they saw that actually Park Hill to be saved, it needed to have a big enough change um, to kind of warrant it. And the idea that that um, for it to be saved, it needed to be reinvented in terms of a public face. Um, so um, on to the next slide, Dan. Um, I mean, to, to do this as a, as a process was um, a very kind of complex, you know, it took a lot of time to do the, the, the sort of technical workings out, but also to um, keep the project going through the economic downturn. There's things like you can see the image on the right with the, the strip back frame, which probably only really happened because of um, the English Heritage funding kept the project going long enough for actually um, Urban Swash to, to get their, their sort of approach to the viability of the scheme together. So there's some kind of really quite sculptural uh, sort of art, artifices of that process. So, you know, normally you'd never see an exposed skeleton of the building like you would here, um, but it's all part of the kind of the beauty of it. And it also, I think in hindsight, it actually raised the awareness of Park Hill in the process really. So there's a big, um, if you like, sort of series of installments that were kind of presented to the city um, and also allowed us to do various things in detail, like Dan said about the, the kind of concrete repairs. Um, the next key intervention was what we call the cut, which was at the um, the base of the tallest section of the building. Um, and what um, there's a there's a slide earlier on where there was a very diminutive kind of boarded up entrance, which is the single the bottom story um, you can see here that formed the main principal entrance into the scheme. So what we wanted to do was was break through this and actually um, 
reveal a number of stories, partly to reveal how Park Hill as a structure actually works, but I think most importantly to make a public realm connection from the exterior and the, the city side into the interior and the courtyards. So it was really kind of key intervention, which um, you know we were really pleased we managed to keep with because it involves a lot of you know, inevitable um, structural gymnastics to kind of get that to, to, to work. And if you if you look onto the next slide, Dan, um, the other key thing about this is is the, the sort of the technical resolution, but also the way we actually moved Park Hill's lifts and the, the issues of obviously the vertical transport onto a kind of public facing, the city facing side of the scheme. You can see the two lifts, the two scenic lifts there on the bottom left, but also the stainless steel staircase as a um, as a sort of um, redolent um, uh, device really to show the change in the scheme. So it's a very deliberate kind of hollowing out of part of the part of the original structure to show that um, there's you know really significant change happening there. And also it works um, to the present day in that the, the sort of main concierge is there and also the marketing suite in the sort of centre of the what's now rather than the kind of marketing, but more the, the sort of community centre as well. Um, and on to the next slide, please, Dan. The, the other thing about the the, um, the cuts was from the actual use of the building. Um, this is standing on that level, so one of the streets actually passes through it, which you can see on the left. But it gives um, the building users, the residents, uh, an opportunity to actually see where they are in the scheme to get more views out to Sheffield, to the, across the city centre, across the Don Valley. But also the the non-residential users, you can see here. Uh, this is Human, who one of the uh, one of the first um commercial users of the building they actually get a sort of presence onto that so again it's sort of active um frontages sort of by default really we're trying to introduce and kind of consider throughout the scheme and then um the next one was about how the building meets the ground and i think um despite the, the you know the very sophisticated approach to the, the way that the building um, mediates the topography, topography, sorry, topography of the site. Um, nevertheless, there was a problem which was pretty apparent when you got to the bigger blocks. So um, in phase one, we were dealing with um, a sort of nine to 13 storey high building. And really the scale of that meant that the ground floors to have someone's um, individual um, terrace or kind of balcony there, it just wasn't quite right and the number of people kind of walking around it, it felt very um it wasn't really defensible so the real move here was to make um throughout the base of phase one um a real range of flexible non-residential uses so um we deliberately secured that in the planning permission so it was very flexible so um from um a nursery to um you can hear see here uh, s1 art space um through to um and if you flick through to the next couple of slides dan um so we've got sort of food and beverage uses um, and all making use of this kind of um exposed um shell of the building again it, we could kind of use the, the the process of actually revealing the honest sort of expression of the building as a kind of feature of it really and kind of um helping to, to sort of enliven the spaces there. So again, the flexibility of the servicing really came, kind of came into its own here where um, the very rigorous sort of over designed um, service distribution allowed us to actually to put in, you know, pretty easily the, the services needed to get, a, you know, a restaurant and sort of cafe working there as well. So um, it's very kind of uh, fortuitous process. Um, and then the next one, um, probably the final one actually, and to a certain extent, perhaps socially the most, the most important one was how do we deal with the streets in the sky? And we never felt really that there was a fundamental problem with the the, the standard cluster and the way that the, um, the the grouping of the flats were. That that was all very um, well resolved in terms of the, the, the aspect and. Um, the, the daylight and, and the vertical circulation sort of available or potentially available. But it's really the issue of um, surveillance of the street and um, obviously the, the proportion of the street as well is pretty much designed to so you could get a float down it. But 
what happened when no one got their milk delivered? You know, it sort of turned into this slightly um, ill-defined zone, which wasn't sort of controlled at either end. Um, you know, so anyone from the city or anywhere could sort of walk anywhere on Park Hill. And you can see that the sort of steps on the left on the, that image, that's someone's door threshold sort of right onto um, a quite public street. So there's this real kind of juxtaposition that it kind of worked when it was, you know, when you did know your neighbours, but as the, the scheme moved on, um, the sort of social dynamics changed, political, political dynamics changed, it it was always a kind of became a problem thing. So um, if you move on to the next one, please, Dan. One of our moves was um, we were kind of preoccupied with trying to find a way of getting some better use of the street. Um, so we, we came up with this idea of reconfiguring the four entrance doors that formed the, the cluster. Um, and this internally within the, the flats, it allowed um, a bit more internal space, which could be used for sort of storage or even sort of um, kind of topically kind of home working or desk space. Um, it allowed us sort of access to the um, centralised risers, which is the sort of peach element you can see there. So that for building maintenance, you didn't have to go into someone's house or flat or home to do that. You could actually do it from the the, um, the actual deck itself. But um, we came up with these what we call the corner windows, and that's really where the, the sort of red cone um, from the, the sort of person in plan there is um, viewing through. It was the idea that you could get an oblique view down um, the street so that there would just be this sort of awareness of um, that people could see you and it wouldn't be, um, you know, the, the, the idea of just someone's entrance onto the street and they there's no other occupation. Um, so we feel that this is this was a really sort of um, successful device in the project. And if on the next slide, there's a image of how we kind of realized one of these. So you can see the sort of four doors there. Um, and we were very keen to kind of expose the original structure, um, which you can see is obviously the, the sort of concrete facing element here. Um, and behind that is the, the, the service riser that we could kind of um, um, allow or make provision for access to. But the most important thing was that we actually gave some relief from the street so that actually this became a, a semi defensible zone that, um, you know, is a bit more sort of collegiate, if you say, if you might say in in its approach where you would have a um, intimated grouping with your other three neighbours and you'd have this this sort of space which um, was um, I mean, it's actually kind of quite a traditional residential device, but it was just sort of obliterated in the original Park Hill. So it's the idea that you have a sort of slight um, break or, or um, interstitial zone between um, your front door and the actual street itself. And on the next slide, you can see the um, the corner window. So again, this is um, the idea that, that obviously residents can sort of see out. Um, so the, the deck itself, you can probably appreciate the proportion there is slightly different from the kind of letterbox proportion that was in the original street. And we reduced the width of, width of the street, but we actually feel it works better because it's it feels less sort of low and overhung. It feels more like a, a sort of normal um, uh, sort of circulation space, really, I suppose, in that sense. And I think the other thing that the, the corner window devices do is, that, is they just break the streets up. They're quite, I think we we worked out one stage that I think there was, um, I think I, would, I think it was two miles of streets throughout the whole of Park Hill. So there's quite a continuous um, uh, regularity, I think, to the, to the treatment that we just felt needed breaking up and bringing more to human scale. Um, and I think the it's also worth saying that the yeah the only the only vehicles that kind of drive up and down the street these days are actually the the cleaning vehicles of the uh, the uh, Great Places um, management team. So no milk milk uh, floats, but they are still actually used for for traffic in that sense. Um, and we've just got a few more slides left, which is just kind of a, a reflection really of um, our journey as we kind of call um, termed it to ourselves. Um, I mean, this this is a image from um, the National Youth Theatre's um, performance that they did. Um, I think it was back in 2011, 
during the process of of the redevelopment. So um, this was the the idea that I talked about that actually during the development, the people's perception of what Park Hill was started to change. So um, because there was um, the, the the sort of funding issues and the viability issues of trying to keep the scheme going, um, there was this stage where actually um, it gave us um, an opportunity for Park Hill to be used as a backdrop. So um, it was used, as I say, as this sort of performance space for the National Youth Theatre. Um, it was also used for other sort of local events like Warp Records in Sheffield um, held their 20th um, anniversary celebrations there. So um, it started to sort of turn the, um, if you like, turn the oil tanker of perception of what Park Hill was into something that was changing. Um, so that sort of was very kind of uh, pertinent in our sort of view back to it. And then we've got a bit more of a graphic representation here of our journey. And it's probably a bit too much to read on the screen here, but we're trying to convey the fact that we went on this sort of um, starting in 2004 with Sheffield City Council's competition to a whole host of experiences and ventures and whatever of you know, going to the Venice Biennale um, and exhibiting the scheme there, um, going with she uh, English Heritage, Sheffield City Council and Urban Splash to um, the Unite in Marseille to, to sort of look at, you know, obviously uh, the, perhaps the greatest example of this this mode of, of modern architecture. Um, and then things slightly more controversial elements like there's um, the BBC documentary about English heritage um, in 2009. And then it sort of started to become more in the architectural press as the as the works kind of emerged. Yeah, and, then, and then other sort of cultural reference points like things like this is England. Um, and various other points right up to um, residents moving in in 2013 and then the scheme being shortlisted for the Sterling Prize in 2013. And obviously there's a whole, ex, you know, the next parts of the story are, are sort of um, have happened on, and are happening as well. So um, the next slide is about the um, one of the, the sort of, again, the, the sort of humanising elements of working on Park Hill were um, this is Ivor Smith, who's sadly um, not with us anymore, but we met him, I think, three or four times during the process. And this was in the, um, this photo was taken during the, the, the kind of preamble to um, the, the Sterling Park Prize ceremony where he came with us up to site. And um, it was amazingly refreshing and inspiring what his attitude and um, perspective were on Park Hill, because we were, initially we were, apprehensive I suppose about what his um, attitude would be to um, the, the sort of new approach to his you know defining element of his career but he he was very um, uh, for you know not forward thinking but he was just very pragmatic about it. he saw the day he stopped working on Park Hill as the start of it really and had, he had a very you know he felt that Park Hill was there to be able to absorb change and take modifications in the future. So he was really um, sort of welcoming welcoming of that really. And the next slide sort of this, this quote we had at the time of um, you know, how he felt about this where he said, um, I think the scheme gives real meaning to the word regeneration. It represents a new beginning, a new vitality. And I sense in those who've been involved the same enthusiasm and excitement that Jacqueline and I enjoyed half a century ago. It'll be a great place to live. And I think also reflecting on that again, you know, 10 years after that, um, you know, we're really pleased that when you go back to Park Hill, it is a place where people live and it's, you know, there is a real sense of community. Um, the next the next slide is just about the, the kind of sterling shortlist. Um, you know, obviously we feel we should have won that perhaps maybe one day in the future, the whole scheme will win it or something. But, um, you know, that, that was um, a very great sort of register for us at the time that um, you know, and I think also for, for kind of social housing, it was it was an important moment, really. Um, and then the final two slides are just about um, what we as HB have sort of done. Uh, this was this was um, we have a sort of process of um, it's a sort of informal post occupancy evaluation where we try and go back to our schemes to actually see um, how they're lived in. So this was in 2017. 
when um, we actually rented one of the apartments as an Airbnb. And we set ourselves sort of various challenges about, you know, could we do something um, using this kind of notion of kind of cooking a dinner party? You know, how would we do things like sort of sourcing the ingredients? Um, how, you know, can you cook in the kitchen? How do you eat? How do you get, how do you um, take the, how do you take the bins and recycling out? Um, you know, and, and sort of other things like how long does it take the, the bathroom mirror to demist once you've had a shower? All, all sorts of, you know, very, not your sort of typical um, post occupancy evaluation, but we just wanted to kind of genuinely find out a bit more about our, our, our sort of interventions and how they work really. So we quite often go back there um, and the, the final slide is about, um, it's just it's sort of quite a small point really, but the one thing that's that's happened is the, the corner windows have been kind of taken on by the residents and the, the, there was a photo, uh, photography competition, I think last time I went up, which was about how people have dressed their corner windows. And it's just the idea that these very individual expressions amidst this quite, um, uh, in some in some ways, sort of um, gargantuan structure. So the idea of the, the kind of personal occupation um, thing kind of comes through, and that was that was one of our very very early ambitions. So uh, there you go. That's a sort of whistle stop of uh, our Park Hill retrospective. Uh, thanks, Greg. Thanks, Dan, and thanks again uh, to James. We've got about twenty minutes left for um, for a few questions. Um, there's a few come through in the chat already, but please do feel free to, to carry on asking them in the chat box if there's anything uh, anything more people do want to ask. Um, I wanted to touch first off on a question from Sam. Um, she said, do you think it's important for architects to upskill and carbon calculation to carry out these analysis on existing buildings? And, and Seb kind of followed up on that, um, talking about how it's a, a really good way of kind of changing the, 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 the kind of terms of the discussion. Um, so I wanted to ask James in the first instance, I think you touched on the fact that you not this was something new to you. Um, so the first question, how did you go about doing it? Um, and, and secondly, kind of how well received it was by the university? Uh, we went about it with great difficulty, I have to say. We, we had to get some help from uh, an academic in at Sydney University um, in order to sort of find the standards. Uh, it's quite complex. I, I, I'm not sure it's something that every architect should really take on. I feel like we have enough on our cases on 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 the, on, on the sort of day to day business, uh, and there are a world of incredibly brilliant specialists in you know, sustainability, environmental, uh, technical specialists out there that can do these things more accurately um, and sort of with uh, greater rigor. Um, for, for me, it's about all that data. So I guess that's the question about how was it received. Well, we've never sort of we've never relayed this information with Durham. This is sort of come post. Um, Paul Charette is sort of like an afterthought uh, about what, you know, trying to think about the bigger picture. Uh, you know, Durham, you know, a university, uh, whether it's a city council, they have they have this data. This is, you know, it's a question about big data and, and, and what you do with it and what you share with it in terms of, uh, I guess, a, a progression towards sort of a low carbon future. Uh, what we found with Durham is that, you know, they, we, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm picking on Durham, but what we found is that they, um, you know, we, we monitor things like, you know, our gas and our electricity consumption, and we can look to the grid and we can see that they're decarbonising and we can look to our usage and, you know, sort of uh, improving our building services to sort of minimise and reduce energy and our sort of user, you know, sort of uh, training users how to use buildings. Uh, we, 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 you know, we monitor waste paper and, and recycling. We've started to, to, to tackle those and we have methods and systems to, to um, to, to, to manage building waste and occupants waste but what we don't do is is look to building waste um, and all that data is there uh, it's just a case of whether you monitor it and whether you use it in order to sort of shape that future i think we're, we're, we're being serious about tackling the climate emergency and hitting you know whatever target is 2030 2040 2050 um, we need to monitor that data and they need that needs to shape the decisions that we make today um, yeah yeah, I think that's a, I think that's a really valid point. I think I'd, I'd probably pass that question um, in, in part over to Greg as well. I think 
the very little touched on in terms of um, carbon calculation and bodied energy in, in your presentation, I think maybe partly because of the time at which this project took place, that you know, things have moved on pretty rapidly um, since kind of 2000, you know, 2003, 2004. Um, having said that, I know that Hawkins Brown have been pretty, uh, you know, at the forefront in terms of um, embodied energy calculations. So I just, I just wondered, um, Greg, if you wanted to talk on whether that was a part of the decision making at Park Hill in the last phase, how much it's informing um, the new phase. I know you guys aren't directly involved with that. But. Yeah, I mean, it's um, it, it's a really interesting point. And, and as, as you've identified, our own um, approach as a practice, but also as an industry has evolved during that time as well. I mean, you know, we were um, from the very early days, you know, we were fundamentally um, adamant that, you know, one of the great things about reusing Park Hill and not demolishing it was its environmental benefits. So, um, you know, things like the, um, the we did a study, um, I think probably which fed into some of our more recent work, our sort of HBIT tool, we call it our, our carbon um, um, sort of emissions tool. Um, it was one of our sort of one of our prototype works um, actually used Park Hill on that. Um, and things like the, say for instance, the brickwork, the brickwork was all, um, the stripped out of the building, was all used on site to make up um, the levels and so on, um, which I think is you know, fairly rudimentary um, reuse in, in, in compared to sort of more sophisticated things um, in terms of measurement these days. But um, I, th I think, um, yeah, it's sort of we do we do do a lot. We don't we don't sort of um, fully measure um, you know every scheme that we do, and we don't um, do it as a default. But we we certainly, I mean, what we're finding in particular is that um, the mode of working with design teams is slightly changing, whereby all our schemes are in Revit and BIM, so the actual quantification of all of this information is easier to, to um, objectify and share and discuss at an earlier stage with other consultants. So um, I think to that extent, every everyone um, or the, the architectural industry to become more familiar with those, um, uh, the, if you like, the kind of the, the language and the, um, the approaches, I think, and to be able to, you know, talk in real terms about it is, is very much um, an important thing for us to address. Yeah, um, I, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm duty bound to mention that um, as part of this series, the, the first event um, was a series of kind of four smaller events, uh, the last of which is, is due to take place on the 2nd uh, of November, that's this coming Tuesday, which is about all life carbon calculations. So, um, you know, looking at a couple of different ways of, of doing it, we've, we've got uh, Tim Martel, who's the uh, the author of the kind of Passive House uh, Ribbon, um, and, and, and Jane Anderson, who's a, a life cycle assessment engineer. And, Jane, and those two people will be talking a little bit about how we can you know, calculate whole life carbon um, as well. Uh, Greg, would I be right in thinking that HBIRT 2 is that an open source tool that you guys have, have developed, or is that just internal? Um, yes, it is. Um, it is open source, um, so it's actually you can access it from our website, not to be too um, sort of mark marketeering about it, but um, it is on. The, I mean, that's not the, the sort of full range of the, the, the detail we would offer through, um, you know, our, our own um, sort of full analysis. But it, it's, it's basically to to get the conversations going early on 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 uh, our new projects and so on. Yeah, that's great. That's great. Um, Seb's asked a really, really good question, and I think it's, it's probably going to be quite a, an open ended question. So I think we might um, we might finish on this one, which is uh, he said about the interest in how we value existing buildings and creative reuse. So historic England seemed to take a very different approach to 20th century buildings like Park Hill um, in comparison with buildings from from previous eras. Um, it's it's you know, the value of heritage generally um, is a is a kind of hot topic. Um, I grew up on Teesside. There was a fairly contentious issue recently where a, 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 an industrial building was listed and then immediately delisted and demolished very very quickly. Um, I think what Seb's asking is um, should we be more robust with our older buildings in terms of bringing them back into some sort of use, or do you think that we will regret the losses? Um, 
in you know the, in the way that Park Hill was effectively replaced everything but this kind of superstructure. Um, so I think I'll, I'll start with um, Dan maybe on that one because you've not um, you've not answered a question yet. If that's okay. Of course, yeah. I mean, I think I mean. I suppose that the thing about Park Hill and similarly to that project you described in Middlesbrough there was they they, they, um, they often can become usually political in terms of you know the sort of the things that they stand for and, and the, 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 the um, um, and actually I'm, Greg, Greg might be a bit more fluent on this but I believe Park Hill was very very close to demolition at one point which you know and there was a change in in the, in the local um, governance and, it, and then suddenly it became um, uh, an option to retain it. Um, I mean, I think, I think, I think one of the biggest, one of the big things is is now that you know, there's there's so much more. We can be so much more robust because of the environmental argument for keeping buildings, and it's such a useful thing for us to talk about. And then, and then we should be all more fluent, and, and we're all trying to be more fluent about using that as a really important argument for keeping buildings. Um, and I think. Um, you know, and then and then that allows us to sort of bring in all the fantastic, you know, um, historical and and, and um, uh, you know the sort of the romance of buildings and cities, and then the memories and, and that sort of the the narrative around buildings and cities and what and how important they are. So, I hope that goes some way to answer the question. But I guess Greg and James might be able to. I mean, what one thing I was going to say is that um, Park Hill to a certain extent is um, something of an anomaly because it's so big, there could be different approaches on different phases. So um, there was there was almost um, a sort of, I think it was represented in, in terms of anything like a deal, but one of the premises was that the first phase will be a very extensively renovated portion of the, um, or visually renovated um, portion of the scheme on the proviso that there will be a more preserved element later down the line in one of the further phases. So there was a kind of balance there. Um, and I, th I think kind of going back to the, the wider question, um, I think it, it's quite interesting with with um, with housing. I mean, Victorian housing, you know, traditional houses are very flexible and very um, quite easy to reuse. You know, obviously they have their own challenges. Um, and I think in terms of um modernist architecture again it, park hill is a particularly good example where it was easy to reuse it um and you know there, there are with um technolo technology um sort of improvements over the last even you know 10 15 years we can do a lot more than we could do um you know certainly um in the 90s when when the, the sort of mood to demolish park hill originally came around um so i think I think um, our, our analysis was really quite pragmatic in we, we identified what was good and what was worth keeping and then trying to find a way of um, overcoming the negative elements and the negative elements were never enough to warrant demolishing Park Hill fundamentally I think so I, I think it you know I think it's such a multifaceted um, consideration that yeah, I, th I just think it needs a proper process of analysis rather than, you know, a, a sort of very binary, you know, demolish it or don't demolish it. There's lots of you know, very, very complex issues to consider before making a, a judgment, really. Yeah, I'd, um, I'll, I'll pass it on to James if that's OK then, just to yeah, talk about I, the robustness. Yeah, you yeah, know, I, I think I'd agree with Greg. There's no sort of binary solution to this and they're often sort of softer shades of grey about how we adapt and reuse uh, buildings. Also, don't think we should get into this sort of save everything attitude. There are lots of bad buildings out there that, that often land in the way of, 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 of good you know, development for all sorts of, of, of complicated reasons. Um, for me, you know, it, it comes down to, you know, it, it's about care, care for the environment, care for care for our buildings, care for what we commit uh, to building, you know, being good custodians, I guess, of, of the cities or the towns that we live in. And the people, the big institutions that commission them, and I, I guess that they're, they're caught in sort of difficult places. You know, you've got the, the, the political, social issues, I guess, around Park Hill, uh, and you've got sort of, I guess, a maintenance issue around Dunelm um, that make them, yeah, left left without that sort of care, they very quickly deteriorate, and then they become this sort of, uh, you know, self 
<laughs> vilifying self-serving sort of uh, uh, end game, which this sort of managed decline, essentially, I think, uh, where we rush, or at least the, the, the prevailing sort of attitude at the moment, I still think is there, is that sort of rush towards demolition and sort of chasing the new. And I think, I guess the, the, the climate agenda has changed that. And I think that's going to change the way we look and keep buildings, don't keep buildings, adapt, modify, reuse, you know. Um, I also think we've, we've got this sort of, you know, they've got this attitude about chasing, continue, continue chasing capital projects. And I think it's, which is great for architects because, you know, capital projects, new buildings, love it. But um, there, there never seems to be funds for, for maintenance and managing of buildings or to repair things. They're, 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 they're rarities, I think, in the world. And I think that's still there, you know, politically speaking, you know, yesterday we had the big announcement of the Treasury with the levelling up funds and it was for almost exclusively for new capital projects. Uh, you know, there's the, where, you know, who, who is who is caring for these buildings? I think and, and it then becomes very hard when you turn around and ask to, uh, you know, a local authority to sort of stump up the millions of pounds when they're not allowed to borrow uh, and, and often the quick and easy ways to sell the building and have someone else demolish it or demolish it and, and sell sell it for the value of its land. Um, and uh, yeah, also, I guess historically in England, I don't sort of, uh, you know, they, they're a body that have, have tried and, well, they actually they've, they've supported uh, listing to Elm House throughout. And I think are pretty great at sort of the work they do in terms of um, recognising the best of architecture and putting it forward for listings. I wouldn't sort of be too down on them. Um, I think I was probably conflicted about the building being listed and the sort of constraints it imposes, but uh, I think Greg and, and Daniel have shown what can be done, you know, creatively uh, rethinking, uh, you know, modifying, adapting um, those structures for the future. Absolutely. I thought the, um, I thought the quote from the original architect of Park Hill about welcoming change in buildings was a, a really, really pertinent one. Um, and you know, allowing buildings to, to be lived and be adapted and, and, and kind of be, become a live on um, once our involvement finishes. I think it's quite a different view to perhaps some of the kind of purist um, views that some architects would take. Um, I think we'll leave it there for this evening. Uh, thank you very much everyone for, for attending. Um, very special thanks to, uh, to Dan. Greg and James for uh, some wonderful, very, very thought provoking um, presentations this evening. Um, we do have a couple of events left, uh, as I mentioned at the very beginning, and for those of you that joined in slightly late. So we have got uh, Jenny Russell um, next, uh, sorry, in two weeks time, talking about Practice Architecture Well, her publications that she's just made available free um, through the RIBA. And then finally, for this year's series on the 25th of November, um, we have Urban Adaption, which is exploring emerging urban environments with um, speakers from Peter Barber, um, from Rider Architects and from Fosters as well. Um, so without further ado, I'll bring this evening's uh, event to a close. Thank you again for your attendance. Thanks again to our speakers and we hope to see you at another YIPF event soon. Good evening.